I took a vacation. I think that's how it all started. I hadn't really taken a vacation and um, my girlfriend at the time took me to the south of France. So I'd, I'd been in London, I'd kind of been through art school, I'd moved to London, I'd been in the city. And then I, was, I found myself in the south of France, uh, just outside of Aix-Provence, and um, the moon was full. It was in the night sky. I had a camera with me. I'd recently just installed a sculpture outside of my studio, a kinetic sculpture, which was a ceiling fan that was attached to the underside of um, the elevated freeway, um, a westway, it's called the westway. And it was lit up at night and it was a kind of signifier. I would turn it on from my studio and it would light up in the distance and spin. It was an indication that I was in the studio working. In order to doc document this, that I was having to speak to photographers, etc. How do I go about this? So in my mind, I still had the kind of math of um, photography and how it all worked. And as the moon came up the, in these evenings in the south of France, I just kind of supposed, presumed, took an educated guess, maybe I could take a photograph with the light of the moon. Maybe there's enough light there. So I'll just guess at 15 minutes, say, and see what happens. And I got the contact sheet back and there was this image, which was a daylight image, which was at first a little su surprising. It was this nice color, strange color, but there was a, a strangeness in the light which I couldn't determine. Um, so this sat in the studio for a couple of years before I then printed it up and it became the first of the full moon series, which is a 15 minute moon. The light, because the moon, because we're turning, um, the light source being reflected light of sunlight, obviously from the moon, the light source moves during the exposure so this softens any shadows. So this is what generates this kind of otherworldly space within the image plane. Um, things, obviously tides and tides become apparent in the oceans because the ocean gets flattened, rivers get smooth, waterfalls become like mist. Um, they, they occupy they occupy our landscape, our dreamscape somehow. It's a landscape that we're unable to see. This is, I've found kind of quite interesting, fascinating. There's obviously a strong connection to the romantic tra tradition. And this is something that has become a major strain that connects all of my work, I suppose. So the moon, the cycle of the moon, I've used it to navigate through my own investigations of the landscape through an, a narrative of the Romantic. So I started, so the project continued or developed through Turner, through, um, through Caspar David Friedrich, in Holland it was Philips de Koenig. Then it kind of broadened a little bit more to my interests in um, Shan Shui um, compositions. So then you're looking more. Then I went to the kind of Yellow Mountains, and ended up in Japan, um, following Seshu, who's a 17th century kind of monk scroll painter. All the while referencing the painting, the I started to cross reference with ph photographers as well. So I would travel west with the pioneer photographers and retrace some of their steps. So it had this, it started off as a, um, a romantic gesture, a, a point of inquisition, in, in, an inquisitive point. Then it became a kind of controlled concept. But then I was involved in this meditation by moonlight. Then I was involved in the act of making the photograph. Then my life was 
becoming connected and had a strong relationship to the landscape. I was going off into, the, into this landscape that we are no longer familiar with, which is the landscape of the night. Um, away from all the pollution, the light pollution that we've generated, that we surround ourselves with. The brilliance, I remember dragging a mare, um, a mare of Esslingen, one night. He wanted to bear witness to the act of making a full moon, so we, we drove out of town and we, quite gung-ho, burst through a, a small wood and came out open to an open ravine and the moon was up, it was clear, and there was this br brilliance of light. Extraordinary quality, very uplifting. Then we turned around after this and drove back into the town and he looked at me just as we approached the kind of sodium lights and he was like, God, this is so depressing. And there is this, there is this, um, depress <laughs> we do weigh ourselves down with our artificial light. Um, so, the, it's the act, I mean, it's a cyclic, obviously it's a, it's a clock, the whole project is a clock, it's managed by the moon. The moon to me is also the nearest point in our local history. It's a historical point. Everything beyond the moon is just too far away. It's beyond language. We soon, our, it's like um, Primo Levi in the Tranquil Star. You, our, our language is so kind of pathetic. As soon as everything is it, it reaches a certain scale, then language just adopts, the written, written language becomes numbers because the vastness of everything out there is beyond our grasp. And the moon, for me, is this, it's our point, it's a point in history that's one we can relate to. I don't know at which point I decide to stop. I don't know when I'm traveling why there's a sense of something. I, I, I believe that the, that the landscape does hold memory. Um, I think that there, is, there are scars that I think our subconscious is super powerful and it's, in, it's prehistoric. I think that we know a lot deeper within our DNA about we can read the landscape far in far greater depth than we're able to communicate what we can see. We can read the flow of lava, we can read the tide, we can read, we can read what's happened there. We understand all this deep, deep down within our subconscious. And I can try to navigate that and open myself up to that on when I'm on a full moon trip, just to try and find a point where within the composition, which is a single point of view single I mean it is described by photography it's um, so I have to find this one spot where there's an openness beyond the frame where the landscape can come through the image from beyond the image that I'm showing you so the idea that beyond the picture frame there is landscape there is the landscape there's also this space of a void so this is a, and the void is a kind of harmony. It's a harmony that can be applied to the basic abstract form can contain a void. But a, a landscape can also hold a void. And these voids are spaces in which we are able to have a moment's reflection. They can hold us, they can hold our subconscious they can stretch time within our, within our thought. And this is something that's happened from very early on in my practice. I was, I was, a, I was on my bicycle and was hit by a car at the first week I was at art school. And I had this outer body experience, all these calculations, all these permutations and calculations happened within my consciousness. That prescribed exactly how and what position I needed to be in in order to stay alive. 
there was this moment thinking, this reading the situation where my body told me I had to use my right hand and I had to put my head underneath my left shoulder and roll, otherwise the car that's just hit me head on, the roof of the car will decapitate me and I have got to get down and twist and go through the window and hit the passenger and that's the only way I'm going to survive. And I calculated this from three different points, three different perspectives. So that this moment happened obviously like this, but I was amazed at how quickly I could perceive this. And that's why the first piece I made was a real time piece, which was this opening up of the studio through a live pre-internet, a live link. So this idea of the spontaneity, this kind of the speed of communication of travel and it's a similar thing that you get when you look at a, I, I kind of reference the idea of when you look at a Jackson Pollock you know it's a Pollock straight away you, and you can read every mark in the first few milliseconds you read it you register it you can you can feel the harmonic you can feel the void there's this kind of calmness that comes up that comes upon you there's a space there that's in between everything that's beyond our conscious and subconscious it's where they kind of come together. The way that a zero, I've started to paint zeros recently because I'm just playing, I'm, I'm just become more aware of that, that if you don't, if, that nothing holds everything together. And without nothing, you won't have a positive or a minus. It's a place where there's a space offered, offered between the two of us where we're able to reflect. And this can, it's an emotional landscape as much as it's a physical landscape, a physical landscape, and it's um, it's it's a place where you're able, through the conditions of the moment, because weather affects the shots um, quite considerably. It's almost as though weather carries the emotion through the landscape. The shots, you know take up a chunk of time. They're not snapshots, they're not glances, they're more than a glance. They can be 15 minutes, they can be half an hour, they can be two hours. Yeah. But what you're doing in that space of time is you're giving the landscape more time to express itself. So you get the structure of the tree is, is described, not just in the way it looks, but in the way it behaves, because you get movement. So you get all this movement and play of time and duration within this shot, within the frame. It's nearer to us in terms of history. <laughs> The history of the light is closer to us, it's more palpable, it's more tangible. You know, the light from the sun, I mean, you can't look into the light. You also, it's quite hard to shoot, to, you, you get strong shadows, it's very, it's quite harsh, it gets, it's, it's quite aggressive. Obviously, light is the thing that generates life, I mean, there's, this we know. <laughs> So this is why we stare in, this is why we're drawn to it. It's a light provider, but the reflective light enables us to see further. I think you can see further through the dark than you can in the bright light. The moon will stay. We won't, you know. It's the, the moon is a point of reference. It's quite interesting throughout kind of longer periods of history. So the moon is a point of reference for maybe the standing stones of Orkney. So you have these four large stones that are super geometric. They look like modern disc sculpture. They look like something else with Kelly would draw in the 50s. And they've been sat there for you know, 7,000 years. Point of reference being the moon. So we have, you know, we have this point of reference that's, a, that's, that's the sculpture that belongs to everybody on the planet. This is a nice thing. And it has this, and it has a, it's a cyclical emotion, of course. And I quite like that. I quite like the fact that it keeps coming around. 
something very reassuring about that. That's a bit romantic. There is a critique of our position, of um, what we're capable of, what we're, of, um, of global politics. There, there's a critique uh, I'm, I, of failing systems. There's a, a critique of failing modernism with the broken numbers. There's a, a critique of um, the math has fallen apart. The math has got us into such a problem now that people are they're losing their voice. Um, it's it's amazing how um, illuminated we feel by the digital age, but it seems to be guiding us into the dark ages again. There's, um, too much information is not necessarily a good thing. We, uh, we overestimate our desire and our needs. There's uh, lots of problems. Uh, the one man's harvest is another man's waste. And that I've shown in my film, I show in my film work. But at the same time, as I kind of go on these political investigations that are quite loose and open, I'm not um, heavy handed with that. I need to present the, the landscape for what it is, the beauty that is there in front of us, what, how special this small moment in time is that we have. It's a Nabokov thing, you know. It's a small glimmer of light between two voids of darkness. Mm.